Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for getting out of bed at 9 a.m. Sunday morning. Really appreciate that. My talk is about four ways to quit the rat race. And um, I would like to also get feedback from you during this talk. Um, I'm very interested in, in, in what you think about uh, quitting the rat race and why you're interested in it. So first of all, uh, what does the rat race mean to you? Why, why have you come to this talk? What, what do you understand by that term, the rat race? Right? Same thing every day, commuting? General monotony. Anyone else? Grind. The daily grind? A job you hate? A job you hate? Not having the freedom to travel, go where you want, do what you want to do. Right? Unsatisfying. Unsatisfying. Yep. The Matrix. The Matrix, <laughs> yes. Implicit slavery. Implicit slavery. Cool. Yep, that all makes perfect sense to me. And, and what does quitting mean to you? What would quitting the rat race really represent for you? Options. Options. Freedom. Freedom. <laughs> Working remotely from Mexico. Right. Working <laughs> remotely. Cool. Congruency between my, my, my personal desires in life and what I actually do. Yes. 40 hours a week or more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting to do what you really believe in or what you really, what you really love. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, I think that all makes perfect sense. And I want to show you, share with you a quote that, uh, that really sums up the rat race very well for me. Uh, this is by Ellen Goodman. Normal is getting dressed in clothes that you buy for work and driving through traffic in a car that you're still paying for in order to get to the job that you need to pay for the clothes in the car and the house that you leave vacant all day so you can afford to live in it. That... That's really what the rat race is, I think. And so what I'd like to do is talk about how I quit the rat race, what my experience is, and then I'd like to share with you other ways to quit the rat race. And I'm very open to questions and so forth as we go through. So I think in terms of what I mean by quitting the rat race, it could mean a number of things, right? I think broadly it could mean no longer having to work in a job you hate. This is what really came up in, in terms of the, some of the comments that people were saying. Or more specifically, it could mean no longer having to work in a job. Or I think really specifically, just no longer having to work. Having the freedom to do what you want with your time. And that, I think, is really what I understand by quitting the rat race. So I quit the rat race uh, at age 38. And I'd like to explain a little bit about uh, how I did it. That was three years ago. And uh, now I enjoy doing lots of things. You talked about travel. Uh, last winter, I traveled around uh, South America with Hannah. And uh, I also played in a, a jazz band for a year and, and did lots of gigs and did some improvised comedy and various other things. And the way that I did it was to start a business that produces value. Uh, this is an example of some of the kind of... Uh, analysis of street networks that my business did. We developed uh, computer programs to analyze accessibility in street networks. And we provided um, consultancy work uh, using this, this technology. And so I started a business and, in 2000, and I grew it. And, and really, I, I, my route to quitting the rat ways was to getting to profit and selling the business. This is a picture of the team uh, on the day that I sold the business. and. Uh, I, I was able to sell it to a large engineering company. I had to work for that company for three years, and at the end of that earnout period, uh, that was really when I retired. So th having done that, uh, I now live from passive investments. <coughs> I'm an individual private investor. I don't use brokers. I minimize my expenses. And I follow a strategy for individual investors that's called the permanent portfolio which was developed by Harry Brown, uh, a famous libertarian thinker and investment uh, advisor. And I can talk a little bit more about that, but it's basically a, a passive investing strategy that has fixed uh, investments um, in a number of different asset classes with, with rebalancing. And I live from uh, that, those passive investments on a 4% safe withdrawal rate from my portfolio. So that's how I did it. And what I now do is prioritize freedom. Uh, I run a podcast called The Voluntary Life, 
And one of the things that I've done on the podcast is to interview lots of other people about how they found freedom. And in doing so, I met and talked to lots of people who quit the rat race in different ways to me. And I learned a lot about other approaches to quitting the rat race. I started a business and sold it, but other people have chosen different routes. And I've learned a lot of things from talking to people and interviewing people from my podcast. Lots of people quit the rat race and everyone has their own story. And I'm gonna share with you some of the stories that I've learned about from people that I've interviewed and also other people that I've just read about. But looking at all of these stories, I think that they all really can be summarized by four basic ways to quit the rat race. And you can combine these different ways and you can choose some parts of one strategy and, uh, with parts of another. But ultimately, you, you can really summarize quitting the rat race in just four ways, I think. So that's what I'm gonna share with you today. I'm gonna share each of these four ways, how they work, and hopefully you will be able to find that one or more of them are more, resonate more for you with the kind of lifestyle that you would like to live. So just to say a few things about the four ways to quit the rat race. What I'm talking about is being financially free. It's not necessarily about being rich, whatever that means to you. In particular, it's not about uh, having a high consumption lifestyle. Uh, for me, financial freedom is about the length of time that you have before you have to work in a job that you don't want to do. And the further you can push that, that length of time out into the future, the more free you are to do whatever you want with your time. And being free to do what you want doesn't mean necessarily sitting on the couch watching TV. If you want to do lots of activities and, and work that you find fulfilling, great. I think that's awesome. So I'm not talking about how you can just stop doing work. I'm talking about how you can stop doing stuff that you don't want to do and only work on things that you really believe in passionately, that, that really give you a sense of fulfillment and are in line with your values. So it's about not having to work, not about not necessarily working. And as I said before, the four ways that I'm going to talk about are not exclusive. So you can use some of the ideas from, from uh, each of these ways and, and combine them together. And I've tried to choose people in my examples who are good examples of one particular route, but a lot of the people that, that I'm going to mention do also use some strategies from, from more the, uh, than one of the, the four ways. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the four ways. Does this all make sense so far? Cool. So, the four ways to quit the rat race, what, what they're called uh, is just summarized here. What we have is unjobbing, intensive saving, having a passive income business, and selling a business. And what, I, what I'll do is go through and I'll talk about what each one of these ways is and explain with some examples of people who actually have done this. Uh, and then uh, uh, we can talk at the end about what resonates for you. So first of all, unjobbing. I'd like to tell you about Michael Fogler's story. Michael trained as a classical guitarist and he always anticipated when he was in college that he would become a teacher. In fact, for many years he tried to be a teacher in a university. He tried to get a job as a classical guitar teacher. There are not many classical guitar jobs in universities. And for a long time, he did odd jobs on the side. He worked on various things to support himself while he was trying to fulfill this idea of a career that he had from the very beginning. That he thought success would mean getting himself into this position where he had a job as a classical music teacher. And years went by and he ultimately realized that he'd been supporting himself from doing various things for many years and he never actually had a full-time job. And then he realized that he just didn't want a full-time job. And he chose to work on things that he really believed in. So he became a peace activist and he did various other things that were meaningful to him. And in order to be able to live that lifestyle, he chose to live very frugally. He lived a very low cost and low expense lifestyle. And he's written a book about this called Unjobbing and I've interviewed him uh, for my podcast. And he coined this term unjobbing to describe this lifestyle. And so, this is a, a one approach to quitting the rat race. And there are many other people who, who do this. Linda Breen Pierce is another person 
who has written about uh, this kind of approach to living. She trained as a lawyer and, and, and did some similar things to, uh, to Michael. And someone who's uh, producing a lot of YouTube videos that you may see uh, today called Elliot Hulse also has an approach that's very similar to this. He's created something that he calls the non-job manifesto. Uh, and it's really about uh, pursuing work that you, that you love and finding a way to, to make that work. So to, to summarize what unjobbing is about, it's really about forgetting traditional career steps, um, giving up on the idea that you have to go through years of doing stuff that you don't want in order to eventually make it, if you like. And the basic idea is just to only ever work on things that you love. And unfortunately, working on things that you love doesn't necessarily pay well. Sometimes it might do, sometimes it, but oftentimes it doesn't. So the approach of unjobbing is really to minimize your expenses in all possible ways, to live an extremely frugal lifestyle uh, with a very low uh, uh, expenditure, and to, in that way, be able to afford to simply work on the stuff that you truly believe in. And a lot of unjobbers also have multiple income streams. They may have various things that they do to support themselves uh, that, that, that allow them to live a life that is, as you talked about, congruent with their values. That is, means that they're working on something that they really believe in. So if you uh, are in a job that you hate and you choose to leave that job and pursue what you love uh, and you're willing to take the consequences in terms of your income levels and look for uh, unconventional ways to support yourself, maybe through having lots of different jobs rather than one particular job. That's an unjobbing kind of approach to, to finding a way to escape the rat race. Are there any questions about unjobbing before I go on to the next one? Yes. Uh Yes. So that seems not to be as secure. You still have to worry a lot about, you know, am I going to have a roof over my head? Yeah, I, that's true. Uh, unjobbing is not uh, a situation where you have investment income that you can live from. You are working, if you like, to support yourself. But the idea is it's not work. It's something that you truly love, right? So if you really love what you do, then there's no problem going to work because you feel passionate about it and, and you know, you enjoy what you're doing. Um, and that's the unjobbing approach. Now, you're right. There are, there are pros and cons to all of these approaches. You don't have the same kind of financial security in this way. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually do need to be aware that you're going to have to keep finding ways of, of getting the, that, that income <coughs> in. So there are pros and cons, uh, but you, you know, it's a lot faster to start unjobbing than it is to do some of the other routes. Okay. We can come back at, at the end and compare them as, again. So the next route that I'm going to talk about is intensive saving. And I'd like to share with you the story of Joe Dominguez. He's kind of the first guy to really write about this approach. Um, and he was born in Harlem. And he made it to Wall Street and became a Wall Street trader. And his approach was he had a very high paying job. And he simply didn't spend any money. He just saved and saved and saved. And he saved to the point where by the time he was age 30, which was in the, in the 60s, he had the equivalent of about just over 400K in today's money. And what he did was at that point, he quit. And he lived from the interest on his savings. And he lived, again, similar to unjobbing, a very frugal lifestyle. He had an extremely frugal approach to, to living. He did not have a kind of crazy consumption habits. Um, but what he did was to, to use that financial freedom to, to work on things that he truly believed in. So he wrote a book called Your Money or Your Life, and it's a very famous book. And it's the first book that really sort of uh, explained this approach to uh, quitting the rat race. He never worked for money again after he quit. Um, so even though he, he wrote this book, I believe that the profits went into a charity to further uh, financial education and so forth. And, uh, and, and that was the way that he chose to, uh, to really quit the rat race. And there are many other examples of people who have taken this approach. So Amy Decision uh, is a, 
a, a writer who, who wrote a lot about this in the 1990s. She published a journal called the Tightwad Gazette, and she, um, uh, she has written a lot about this approach to intensive saving. And in terms of people who are writing about this now, Jacob Lundfisker is a guy who writes a blog called Early Retirement Extreme, um, and he also uh, did this approach to intensive saving. Uh, he was actually um, working in a university and uh, just had a very, very low consumption rate, had very low expenses, simply saved really intensively. And a guy called Mr. Money Mustache, who writes a very entertaining blog, uh, also had a similar approach, retired in his early 30s from intensive saving. So what is the uh, intensive saving? Well, it really, we're talking about really intensive saving, more than 50% of your income. So the idea is uh, to really focus on uh, saving as much as you can. And given uh, various assumptions about uh, interest rates and so forth, if you save fi over 50% of your income and are able to live from th the rest of the income, then you can retire in about 16 years. If you save 75% of your income, then you can retire in about eight years. So this is a, a very, very sort of specific lifestyle choice to really focus on saving. And it's not just that you're focusing on saving to live from what it is that you saved, you're really also relying on the power of compound interest. And so, what, you know, as you, you may know, you start saving, you put away some money, and that money earns some interest, and then those, both your initial capital and the interest then earns more interest, and it compounds. And compound interest is really, really a, a, a very powerful tool for increasing your savings. And not a lot of people think about this, but you know, if you, for example, if you put away $3,000 every year from when you're 21 years old, but, and you earn 8% uh, before inflation, not after, but before inflation, which is doable if you have a diversified portfolio, what do you think you get when you're 65 when you retire from 3,000 pounds a year? You're gonna have put away just over 100,000 in terms of your actual savings every year, what do you think the compound interest is going to give you? $500,000? It's over a million. That's the power of compounding interest. So now, obviously, that's a very long time scale, and that's assuming certain things about what interest rate you're going to be able to get. But this is the basic concept, is that you really focus on intensive saving. And then once you have got to a point where you're able to retire, you live on what's called a safe drawdown rate from your savings. So uh, if you have passive investments like a diversified portfolio or maybe some rental properties and things like that, then a safe drawdown rate is essentially an amount that you can take every year without actually running out of money in the end. It's a sustainable rate. And to cut a long story short, there's a lot of debate about this, but basically the most consensus figure is 4%. You're able to safely take 4% from your from your savings portfolio because you will earn more than uh, inflation and the 4% to cover that so you won't be eating into your, to your capital. So that's the basic approach of intensive saving. Any questions about that? Well, when you talk about saving, saving is also pretty risky because depending on where you put it, um, it can go away. You know, especially if you're talking about going to these financial institutions where you send your money away with the promise that someday you'll get it back. And especially in the times that we're living in, I don't want to digress into a really different, different conversation, but when it comes to savings, I mean, like, I, I work for a regular corporation, I have a 401k, but I'm assuming that by the time I turn 65, one way or another, a lot of that's probably not going to be there. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all stock investments, things like that. I mean, I, I, I'm not particular, particularly sure about the solvency of our, our financial system right now. So, I mean, like, some suggestions on how to achieve these in, in, in interest rates or these uh, Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I think there are real risks, and it is important to, to look very carefully at that. And I mean, that's a, that's a big topic. Right. I can very briefly tell you uh, my approach, um, which is one of the really important things about investment and saving is the expenses. Uh, that actually a lot of people are interested in saving, and they end up paying brokers and other people a lot in their savings. Um, unfortunately, uh, you're not gonna get a lot of compound interest if you have high expenses. And so my approach is very much to manage my own savings. But I also agree with you that if you simply put all your money in stocks and bonds, 
uh, you may have real problems because there are financial conditions in which both those asset classes will, will do really badly. So I think it's important myself to have uh, precious metals as well. Um, and, and I also think there, is, uh, uh, you know, there are benefits to holding some of your assets outside your country of origin. So th that's a big topic, and I agree that there are risks, but I think there are also ways that you can mitigate those risks. Yes. Well, I have, um, doing the permanent portfolio, and you can back test it as well. Um, I agree that, uh, I mean, stocks have been a disaster over the last decade. Um, and I think there, is, there, is a, there, are, there are lots of risks. If you, if you have a very concentrated portfolio in one asset class, then, then that's, uh, that can be a disaster. Um, the permanent portfolio is an idea by Harry Brown where you, you have a quarter of your savings in stocks, a quarter in bonds, a quarter in gold, and a quarter in cash, and you just rebalance whenever any of those um, asset classes go o above or below a certain rebalancing band in your portfolio. And what you do with that is you actually harvest the volatility within the market. So it doesn't really matter if things are uh, moving around because you're actually making money by buying cheap and selling expensive. So I agree with you that um, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, you're not necessarily gonna make 8% before inflation every year. And there are, you know, especially in these times when we have financial repression, where interest rates are being held extremely low, it is, it is difficult. That doesn't mean that you can't make a return. It doesn't mean that you can't look to ways to uh, overcome some of the things that are going on at the moment, like uh, interest rates being held so low. And I mean, for example, although stocks did really badly in the last decade, I mean, gold was amazing. So, gold and yeah. What I would say is that I think there's two, two questions. One is, are you saving? And the second is, are you getting the returns that you need to? And I think the first thing is, you know, if you're not doing the saving, then you're never gonna get the returns in the first place. It is an open question as to how you get the returns. Um, and there are lots of different approaches to that. Yes. It depends on what asset classes you hold. Um, you will obviously generate interest in some, so if you, if you are holding bonds, then that's gonna give you in, uh, uh, income. Uh, if you hold precious metals or something, then you're gonna be uh, get selling some of that and, and uh, taking capital gain on, on what, you, what you sell. So yeah, you, make, you, you, you draw down both from rebalancing and also from the interest that you make on assets that do produce uh, a return. Okay. The next route that I'm going to talk about is passive income. So I'm going to give you um, an example from a guy called Pat Flynn. So Pat's story is that uh, he was an architectural draftsman, and he was working on CAD and, and doing all these drawings in, in, an, in a, an architecture firm, I think. And he was downsized out of a job, and he really didn't expect to be working for himself, but uh, he, he got downsized out of a job. and. As it happens, he had been taking some exams to pass uh, various technical certifications, and he'd made a blog about these exams that he was taking and his revision for the exams and the things that he was learning. And it turns out that his blog was actually very popular. And a lot of people who had to take the same exams were looking at his blog and using it to help them for their own exams. And so without really planning it, he realized that he had a popular blog and he added adverts to the blog. And then he started selling eBooks. And then he started selling other products. And he really moved from being an employee to being someone with an online business, selling digital products, uh, and, be, and living from passive income. And he now runs a, a website called smartpassiveincome.com, which you can go to. And this is where he talks about this approach and gives all sorts of examples of how he created passive income and how he does it. And there are many, many other people um, who, who do this approach. You've probably heard of Tim Ferriss, and he wrote The 4-Hour Workweek, which was really the first book to sort of write explicitly about passive income. 
Uh, he's a little more complicated because he also sold businesses and, d and did other things too. Um, but that book is very much, uh, has been really influential on people's thinking about passive income, uh, especially from online businesses. And there are lots of people who have online businesses uh, who, who do this. So Laura Roda also has um, a website doing uh, social media marketing, and, and that's a, another example of someone who's sort of running this passive income model. So the idea behind passive income is you do a lot of upfront work um, to create an automated business. And often that is online. It could be in property, but it's generally these days uh, the easiest way to do it is to have an online business. And you take various uh, um, routes to minimizing your expenses. One thing that's written about a lot in this field is geo-arbitrage, and all that means is really putting yourself somewhere really cheap and selling your digital products to places that uh, you can get good, uh, more expensive, that you can sell expensively. Um, so you might go and live in a low-cost uh, environment, uh, uh, but still uh, sell through the internet to markets that can pay well. And the approach is to really maximize your delegation. And there are lots of ideas about this. Uh, Tim Ferriss talks a lot about having virtual assistants. If you have uh, an online business, it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, to automate things as much as possible. But where you do have to work with people, the idea is you try and maximize delegation. And the plan is really to live from the long-term income that is provided by the business, by the ongoing business. But you quit the rat race because it's a passive income business. You don't have to be there every morning. You don't have to be directing people every day and organizing things every day. You do a lot of work up front to create products that you can sell and scale very easily. And in that way, you give yourself the freedom to do what you want with your day. And so that's the passive income approach. Any questions about that approach? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the, the, the risk with starting a business is that what a lot of people do is recreate their previous job. So maybe they had a particular skill in one area and then they go and work for themselves and they just carry on doing that. And uh, that's not creating a business, that's creating a job for yourself. And uh, as uh, someone once wrote in a book that I found quite funny, that's the worst kind of job because you're working for an insane person, <laughs> you're, like yourself. You've got the worst boss in the world. Um, so the idea really is to make yourself obsolete as quickly as possible and to work on your business rather than in your business. And the way that you do that is by actually changing your mindset to, to designing the business rather than being the person that everyone comes to within the business to get answers to everything. And uh, that's a big topic in terms of how you go through that. But my focus was really on uh, proceduraliz standardization, proceduralization, and automation, and doing that for all the processes that, that we did in my business. Yeah. Cool. Right. So lastly, selling a business. And I've talked a little bit about this um, in terms of my, my own experience, but I'll just give you another example quickly. Uh, this is Derek Sivers story. Derek was a musician and circus clown, and he wanted to sell his music. Um, as an independent musician, he didn't really know how he could do that. Um, so he wanted to make a website for himself to sell his CDs. And kind of without meaning to, he created CD Baby. So a lot of other independent musicians came to him and said, hey, uh, can you sell my CDs through your website as well? And this, this, his business grew until it became the largest online independent music store. Um, and he sold it in 2008 uh, for over 20 million, I think. And he created a charitable trust, which he takes a drawdown, I think, of four or five percent each year. And on his death, that charitable trust will go towards uh, independent musicians. And while he's alive, he's living from the income that, that, uh, that he created. Uh, by, by selling the business. And he now writes about entrepreneurship and he started various other businesses and he has a blog about 
uh, his approach to these things. So he's another example of somebody who took this route of selling a business. Key things about selling a business is that it's really only a viable option if you have a profitable business. This is notwithstanding some strange internet business startup models where there is no, there no profit, but those are so unusual uh, that I think it's better to actually concentrate on the 99% of the world where people actually buy profit uh, in a business. Um, so you have to create a profitable business. You have to really get your business to a point where it is generating profit. And you need to be able to find a buyer. You have to have a business that, that you know, there is a market for people who would, could potentially uh, buy your business. In my case, I started a very specialist type of computer modeling consultancy, and I sold it to a large engineering company who wanted to add that skill set and that technical capability to their diverse range of, of services. Um, and so what you're doing is you're really selling your ownership of the business for a multiple of, of profits. So for a multiple of your, it's really about your expected future profits. And what multiple you use is a matter of negotiation and depends on the industry that you're in and can depend on uh, many other things uh, about your business. And, uh, but essentially, it, it really comes down to how much profit do you make and how many times that profit is the buyer willing to give you to, to uh, get ownership of the business. And you may need to stay on uh, afterwards to help integrate your business into whoever buys uh, the, the business of whoever buys it. I had to stay on for three years, which is quite a long time. Um, some people stay on for, for a, a year or so. And then once you've done that, you're back to something very similar to what we talked about with the extreme saving. You, know, you, you, you get the capital from selling the business, and then you're living from safe drawdown on passive investments. And you're able to do what you want with your time you know, live according to your values if you want, maybe start another business or do, thing, do whatever you like, but, but, but that's essentially the route in terms of selling a business. Any questions about that particular route? Yes? Yeah, I think it's extremely difficult to buy a business. I personally have no interest in buying a business because it normally goes wrong. And uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's to do it wisely and successfully is very, very hard. I'm very pleased that I sold my business because I was the one actually selling. Yeah, but I was referring to when you do create the business and walk away from the buyer, if you sell it, the business doesn't do as well as the newer one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's hard to buy a business successfully because afterwards, you know, you, you, ha you have hopes for how that business is going to perform. And afterwards, uh, it, it, it often does not work in the way that uh, was expected. And this is, I mean, this is a, a real cliche in, in large corporate buyouts that everyone expects this is going to be an amazing thing and it turns out to be a, a complete uh, waste of money. It's hard to do, to, to do successfully. Also, there is often a, a distinction between what people think they're buying and what people think they're selling. So for example, within a business, you have resources. In my case, the resources were things like the software that we created to do the analysis. And you have procedures, which are the way that you do business, how you deliver that product. And sometimes a company that wants to buy a business is looking at their resources. They think we want that software, but they don't they're not that interested in the procedures because they have their own culture, their own way of doing things. That was the case in, in my case. I sold my business to a very large multinational consultancy. They did not want our procedures. They wanted us to conform to their procedures. Now, as it happens, we were far more efficient and profitable because we were a small, nimble company and we sold to a large, lumbering corporation. And Unfortunately, they weren't able to keep you know, those procedures because they had an idea about you know, everyone being in one building and everyone using the same IT infrastructure and so on and so forth. So it's very hard to do uh, successfully. You know? And I think ultimately uh, a lot of the problems that come, uh, come from those kind of cultural differences that in buying a business, 
uh, the buyer often wants to absorb that business into their own organization, and they lose the efficiency of the procedures because they're buying, they think they're buying resources, people and software and stuff like that, but they're actually buying procedures, except that they don't use them and they, they lose out. Yeah. What was your relationship like with your buyer? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And um, uh, so I sold my business through a trade sale, which I th for me is by far the, the preferable way of doing it. I mean, people, uh, the other way, you can sell ownership through other ways. You can uh, float your business on the stock exchange and various other things. And all the other routes to me look really stressful. Uh, trade sale, I think, is, is by far the easiest route to sell your business, at least in my opinion. And the trade sale that I did was to a long-time partnering company uh, that we had done a lot of work with. So uh, we, as I said, were a very specialist consultancy doing a, a, a very specific thing. And we worked together with this big engineering firm a lot. And they would add us into their projects to provide our specialist expertise. And that was really important because that was a relationship that we built up over years. They could see the value that we were adding to their projects. And so each time they were paying us to come and do something specific. Um, and you know, the, the, you know, from their perspective, it was like, well, why do we keep paying these guys when we could actually just have them as part of our team? And then we could uh, offer their services all, on all projects that we do and we wouldn't have to pay them so much and so forth. So that was their approach. So I, th I think that partnering with complementary companies that are bigger than you, that have a lot of cash, is, is how a great way to find people who could potentially buy your business. And we did also look, right? I mean, we didn't just uh, stumble across uh, the sale. I, I, it doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen, and you have to really plan for it and think about selling. Um, so, you know, we really looked at how we could remove barriers to that happening, and we planned it very consciously. So, if you want to sell a business, you know, it, it's it's like selling anything. You, you actually have to think about the sale and think about the buyer and think about the value proposition that you're offering and how you're going to make it work. Sure. Well, I'd like to provide some thoughts on these four different routes together before we open it up to your comments. Because I think they're very different. You know, uh, we talked about some of the pros and cons while we're going through it. And they, are, they do have very different pros and cons, but there are some common features about quitting the rat race using any of these four routes. If you're interested in this, uh, I think it's really worth thinking about these, these common features. The first is that uh, you have to have the courage to be unconventional and to live an unconventional lifestyle. All of these routes are unusual ways to live compared to the debt-ridden, day-by-day jobbing lifestyle that you know, we know is the, the sort of norm in, in our culture. Um, so whether it's starting a business or going unjobbing or being an extreme saver, these are all unusual things and unconventional things. And they, people will frown and raise their eyebrows and so forth. And so you have to have the courage to, to live unconventionally if you want to do this. All of these routes in their own way are, are about minimizing expenses and um, we talked about that in terms of things like, you know, from the extreme savers and unjobbing, living a, a really low expense lifestyle and really living uh, as cheaply as possible. But even if you're building a business, you know, you really have to control expenses and you really have to, to manage uh, your expenditure. So all of these approaches, uh, really, uh, you have to take that, that kind of approach, especially tax. Obviously, if you're an entrepreneur, there's lots of ways that you can minimize your tax burden. If you're an unjobber even, you know, that approach is also about minimizing tax, often by having relatively low incomes and relatively low tax burden uh, or tax bracket because of it. And they're all about creating more than you consume. So all of these approaches depend on you being frugal, you know, creating more value than you actually consume. Again, this is completely against the current sort of cultural norm. And uh, whether that's through extreme saving or through selling a business and then you know, not spending it all on crazy stuff, 
Uh, it's really about uh, creating more value than you consume, saving and being frugal. And another common feature is that you really need networks to do any of these approaches. We like to think of ourselves as rugged individualists. And you know, this is part of our culture, to think of ourselves as, as, uh, uh, as individualists. But what's really important in any of these approaches is that it's so vital to cultivate your networks. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you absolutely have to network with people and have to you know, cultivate your relationships. And if you want to be an extreme saver, you have to do the same thing or an unjobber. If you're going to live from multiple income streams and, and try and be flexible, you need good networks. You need to, to be able to uh, uh, trade and interact with people and, and, and cultivate your networks. And even if you're an extreme saver, uh, Amy Decision has a, a, a nice little story that she talks about in terms of her frugal lifestyle. Um, when her teenage daughter got her ears pierced for the first time, she was going to go to the mall and buy some earrings. And Amy said, wait a minute, don't do that yet. Let me, let me see what I can do. So she phoned around her friends and family and asked if anyone had any spare earrings. And you know, by the next day, her teenage daughter had all these earrings, you know, loads and loads of them. Because people looked and they had some they didn't need anymore, and suddenly she had like 10, 10 sets. And, you know, that's, that's the power of networks and looking after your networks and having, cultivating your networks. Any of these approaches, you know, you really need to be able to, to uh, provide value to others and rely on them as well. And the last thing I want to say about it is that I think for any of these approaches, whichever one resonates with you, you have to find purpose in your life choices in, in pursuing this. There's no point in trying to be an intensive saver if it's gonna be a hassle to you and an inconvenience. I think you have to pursue that route if you really find meaning in financial independence, if you really find purpose in that lifestyle. And the same goes for unjobbing, and the same goes for being an entrepreneur, building a passive income business or selling a business. These are all approaches that involve sacrifice to a certain degree, they all involve deferring gratification. And in doing so, you know, if you find purpose in that choice, then you can find joy in it too. You know, it can be a really fulfilling thing to pursue any of these approaches. And not just because you're getting towards the point where you have quit the rat race, but in doing so, in the process of doing so, you're living your values. And that is really rewarding. That's a really meaningful life. So I just want to end with this quote. We act as though comfort and luxury were the chief requirements of life, when all that we need to make us really happy is something to be enthusiastic about. Thank you very much. <laughs>